For most of us, the Middle Ages have always been relegated to a distant corner of our minds. They lie in the shadows as a thousand year somnolent stretch after barbarism laid waste to the brilliance of classical Greece and shattered the global community and culture secured by Rome till those clever geniuses of the Renaissance put civilization back on track and the modern world was born. Even stranger it has seemed are the scholars who actually want to study that black hole. We call them medievalists. We see their painstaking work in studying the fragmented post-Roman world as a curiosity disconnected from our world today as a virtuous exercise in the value of knowledge simply for knowledge's sake. But our speaker tonight will change forever any notion you have of fusty medievalists disses dissecting a dead and static society. Sarah Davis Secord intends to show us that already in the 700s and 800s, the Mediterranean world was teeming with commerce and communication. It seems the first Cold War between Christendom and Islam did not create walls as the second century Cold War did to separate the two camps. Sarah will tell us of a surprising degree of mutual penetration with the south of Italy as a fulcrum. Sarah is everything you don't imagine a medievalist to be. <laughs> she comes to us not from a Gothic ivy tower, but from the land of enchantment, the University of New Mexico. There she is associate professor in the Department of History and Director of Graduate Studies, and recently served as president and director of the Rocky Mountain Medieval and Renaissance Association. Her books, written for both scholarly audiences and for a broader public, are based on meticulous research in commercial and civic archives that few, if any, have explored before. So be prepared for surprises. Please join me in welcoming Sarah Davis Secord to the Friends of the Institute. <laughs> Yeah. How's volume? We're good. Thank you all so much. Um, particularly, I want to thank the friends of IAS um, and Catherine and Pamela for organizing this. But I really, really want you all to know how grateful I am, all of us members are, for everything you do to help support and make this place possible. Um, I, I, words simply cannot express my gratitude for the chance to be here and the fact that this place exists um, as the academic paradise that we were promised. <laughs> um, and it really truly is. So thank you and thank you for being here tonight. Um, I am going to talk about commerce and connection and I'm going to think with a kind of new framework um, that medievalists are sort of playing with right now, which is globalism and globalizing frameworks. And, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the things I think that it helps us do and actually some of the limitations. Because of course, um, as Yuki put it, right? We think of the Roman world as kind of extending and, and globalizing or at least being hemispheric, right? Um, and then that kind of traditional notion of the Middle Ages is that all of that stopped and, and there's various kind of scholarly debates about why that stopped. But I argue that it did not stop, right? Many of us now are saying this is actually a world in which we can see huge amounts of interconnectedness um, and back and forth exchange in really uh, cool ways, very cool ways. Um, okay, I'm gonna take my glasses off so if you make any faces at me, I won't see you. <laughs> Um, I want to start with this image, which is a ninth or eighth, eighth or ninth century uh, fragment of a beautifully woven piece of red silk. And it was found in a reliquary casket containing what was believed to be the relics of the sandals of Jesus. 
and it is held today at the Vatican Museum. If any of you have been to the Vatican Museum, you know, you leave the Sistine Chapel and you kind of you're dazed and, and everything is, is sort of dark once you leave that. This is immediately to the left and you could sort of overlook it. But it's a really stunning piece of work. Um, it is um, a, a piece of what's actually known as samite, which is the, some of the heaviest and most uh, densely woven silk, um, often interwoven with gold or silver threads. It features, as you can see, um, a kind of mirrored representation of the Annunciation scene, right? The scene where the Virgin Mary, who's seen here enthroned, is visited by the Archangel Gabriel and told what is, is coming for her life. And we can see that it is uh, surrounded, each one of these images is surrounded by a roundel of floral motifs and separated by palmettes. Um, this is a very sumptuous piece. Um, here's a little bit of a close up. Crafted with the very best materials um, and the highest levels of artisanship. And we think that it was probably made in Byzantium, in Byzantine Syria in particular. So Greek, Christian, Eastern Mediterranean region. The threads themselves were probably dyed in that same area, um, probably by women who were um, laboring in the silk industry by that time. Mm -hmm. The silk thread itself, though probably originated in China, where silk working technology was very um, early developed and then kind of slowly spread in ways that we could talk about if you wanted to, right? Um, sometimes by theft, sometimes by sneaking things out, right? Because China was pretty protective of its sericulture. Uh, again, uh, it was probably tended by women, right? The cocoons were probably grown and tended by women. Um, and then the threads, once they were woven into this silk thread, were probably carried across the silk roads um, in a sort of staged mercantile exchange, probably by male merchants. The finished item was probably given as a diplomatic gift from the imperial court at Constantinople to the papal court at Rome. So this isn't really, an, that moment isn't really exchange, but it is sort of gifting and diplomacy. And then at some point after it had been used for something, then it was used to wrap the, the relics of, of Christ's sandals. So this one piece of cloth is woven from the threads of strands that link it to many places, men and women of different faiths and different cultures in many different areas, right? The Byzantine, Greek, Eastern Mediterranean, China, the Silk Roads in those various stages, the pathways of Central Asia, and then, of course, into the Mediterranean region. These types of interconnections are based both on economic exchange, but also a kind of cultural transfer that I'm going to walk through in, in a minute, right? And this cultural transfer we find in both economic and non-economic contexts, such as familial settings, religious and social settings, diplomatic engagements, like I mentioned, and of course, religious movements, religious spaces, and things like that. And historians now, today, are playing with, like I said, kind of toying with this idea of a globalized medieval world. And, and this is, um, there's, there's a lot of kind of threads about what the global Middle Ages means, um, but I argue it does not simply mean interconnection, right, but an interdependence of some type um, and kind of two really key facets. One is that it is multinodal, that is, it's coming out of and into different areas, and the other is that it is multidirectional. So, for example, you may have probably already known that medieval Europeans loved spices, right? And that they're bringing in huge quantities of things that would be aromatic, medicinal, um, and culinary um, in, in, you know, huge, huge cartloads, right? Across the Indian Ocean, across the Mediterranean, um, and up into Europe. A lot of that we think of is for the later medieval period, so I'm going to do something quite different. I'm going to mostly talk about the ninth century today, which is quite early, um, which I think is kind of cool, right? It's a kind of a period that most people don't know about. 
But I also think that there's something different besides this notion of, of a silk, um, a spice, well, and silk as well, import trade, right? In that we're not simply talking about Europeans accepting or desiring goods, but that this exchange goes in multiple directions at one time um, or over, you know, close periods of time, um, and that it is in some ways really not about Europe. <laughs> so the question is, where's the center, right? When we think about what the Middle Ages is, we tend to think about, you know, Europe, European spaces. In other words, a globalized world is one that has its center and its framework in a very different place. Europe is a part of the story, um, but if we're gonna think about globalizing connections, we're gonna have to shift our perspective. We're gonna have to shift our framework a little bit. And it's going to put at the center of our story, not simply places and cultures that were not necessarily a part of our story before, but it's also gonna put at the center of our story, the means of connection itself. Right? Not simply that Europeans wanted stuff, which they did, but also how did that stuff get there? And how did that imply or bring cultural transfer at the same time that it brought highly desired goods, right? So we're not simply talking about your Amazon delivery driver, right? We are talking about agents of cultural transformation and a flow in multiple directions from multiple nodes. Okay, to get into it then. That that image, right, where we have we have two different images, but it's still participating in this kind of mirrored image. This is a much more classic example of that mirrored image. And what we have here is a late eighth or again ninth century uh, piece of silk that was probably made in Central Asia. And the reason that um, our historians tell us that this is, is the case is you can see that what we have here is that roundel, right? We have the, the thing around it, and we have the two mirrored images. Um, and this is a very a classic Persian image, right? This roundel with the two mirrored images in it. But if you kind of look closely at what the image is in here, it's a Chinese dragon. And the dragon, of course, has very strong cultural resonances in China, but not necessarily of everywhere else. So if you really look closely, and this is open access, it's at the Met um, in New York, you see that the dragon is missing its head, right? Both of them. So we've got the kind of elements of dragonness without actually um, the full concept of what a dragon is. So art historians tell us that this may have been made in uh, Central Asia, right? So it's pulling this round them with the mirrored images from Persia, right, from Western Central Asia, and the silk technology from the East, from China, and the, the dragon imagery from China, but probably sort of misunderstanding it. So they think that it's probably happening somewhere in Central Asia, where it was actually woven, right? So we've got this kind of thing that is moving in multiple directions, right? Multi-directional. We've got something that isn't just moving this way and is desired in this place, but is kind of moving in different directions at once. And some of the ways in which the silk, the, the designs, the cultural elements and the styles get transferred are by these mediating agents, right? People who are themselves moving along these Silk Road pathways, one of those people is called the Sogdians. And the Sogdians did have a homeland which was centered in what is today Tashkent, somewhere in Western Central Asia, um, but are today not really known, right? We don't know much about the Sogdians except through kind of some of these scraps. You can see we do have some texts with Sogdian written on it. And the Sogdians are really, really, really neat. Um, they're really interesting people. Some of them are, are Christian, some are Buddhist, some are Zoroastrian, some are Manichaeans. There's a whole different uh, sets of religious um, texts that are kind of moving back and forth across this Silk Roads area. And the Sogdians are part of that. I wanna just pause on this image because I super love it. Um, and this is a, uh, 
a group of Sogdian musicians who are on a camel, and this is one of those Tang uh, burial Chinese um, Chinese burial right um, ceramics. And it is done in the kind of typical style of the three color glazes. Um, the, the typical three colors are this kind of brown, a cream color, and then the green. You can see that there's a fourth color, and that fourth color is cobalt, which itself is a highly expensive imported into China, probably from Persia, probably by the Sogdians or people like them. And so we've got this kind of interesting layering in this one image, right? Again, we're showing the Sogdians who are known for being musicians and also dancers. And that's something I love here. So you've got these two images here of Sogdians doing the traditional Sogdian whirl. They were known as entertainers and for doing this very particular dance. Um, and they were highly sought after in the Chinese uh, courts, right, as entertainers, but of course also as traders. And so we, if we're thinking about a, a world of globalized connections, a world in which things and ideas and people are moving back and forth, one of the things we have to do is to focus on the people, the agents who are doing this kind of, of, of work, right? Moving these things around. And the Sogdians and their camels, I think, are just really neat ways to do that. Okay, back to our silk, though. Sarah culture itself, that is the raising and, and processing of silk, um, did eventually move westward, right? It did, did not stay in China, despite the fact that the Chinese uh, were trying to keep it its secret. And it eventually moves westward, and it moves into Byzantium, right? The Greek, uh, Christian, Eastern Roman Empire based at Constantinople. Here we have, again, this, I, this image is as good as I could get, so I'm sure you'll have to squint. Again, you can see here, we've got the round door, right, with the kind of digital or floral motifs. And then we have the two mirrored images here. In this one, we have a kind of a Greek mythological image that's being depicted. Um, these are the Amazons. And if you can see better, it's clearly an Amazon with the breast. And they're hunting, right? So we've got this kind of connotations being picked up from ancient Greek um mythology and then we also have once it gets into byzantium this style then becomes christianized so this our roundel here is square but it's still the same kind of floral pattern and then we have our mirrored images and these are holy warriors um and they are attacking you know the serpent right the traditional symbol of the devil As you probably know, right, much of the Byzantine Greek world was then conquered um, in the 8th, 7th and 8th centuries by Islamic forces and fell under um, Islamic domain. Most of the Byzantine silk workshops were just carried on, right? They just kept on going. And they continued to produce these same things. And as you can see here, we have almost the same image, right? Almost the same with the roundel and the warrior hunting, but over the top of it, we have an English, um, well, inscription, right? But it says Bismillah, right? In the name of God. So we have these styles, right? These technologies, the images themselves, and then the, the, the kind of larger style moving back and forth um, across the Eastern Hemisphere through trade, exchange, gifting, entertainment, right? Conquest. Um, all of these kinds of things. Silk technology and silk styles then, of course, enter into the Mediterranean. And just to complete the hemisphere, I want to show you my very favorite piece of medieval art ever. If you've been to the National Museum in, um, in it looks weird, that's a, just a regular O, in, uh, in Barcelona, this is the Bacio Majesty. I um, mean, you can see here we have Christ on the cross, and he is wearing silk robes that are very much meant to look like robes that would have been made out of silk in the Islamic Mediterranean, and at the bottom, a fake Arabic inscription. So we've got Jesus wearing Muslim-looking robes. So we get this kind of silk technology, and again, these images, this is just painted on here, right? But again, it's that roundel with the kind of floral and the palmettes. So we're moving all the way across, right? 
as expected, the Silk Roads, which are right, the land-based routes up here, play a huge role in the transmission of these items, these technologies, and these styles. A similar set of pathways, though, took place on the Indian Ocean, and this is what this map is. Sometimes historians will refer to this as the Maritime Silk Roads or the Maritime Ceramic Route because of the vast quantities of ceramic that were shipped across the Indian Ocean and the Arabian Sea. And again, just the bare facts of economic exchange and technological transfer have long been known to medievalists, even ones working in the periphery, right? That is in Europe. We have always known this, right? Porcelain is another technology like silk that was developed in China and perfected in China and became a highly desired commodity in Western, re Western regions, particularly in the Islamic world, where it was both purchased and imitated. We know the same thing about paper technology, right? Making paper eventually makes its way into the Mediterranean through this kind of similar pathways. Also navigational techniques like the Latin sail, right? The triangular sail, magnetic compass, the quadrant, um, and various things that helped navigate. So that, it's, that's not necessarily new, right? But the focus and the perspective is somewhat different. Okay, so here we have a bowl um, this was made in 9th century, probably in Iraq, probably in, in Basra. And it is an example of an earthenware bowl that was meant to look like Chinese porcelain, right? So again, we've got the technology, but not quite the technology, not at least to the same level of fineness that the Chinese are doing. Um, and it was clearly being made um, in imitation uh, of the styles and the colors. but. We can see here, we've got the Arabic word for happiness inscribed twice. Okay. Made in Iraq in imitation of Chinese styles. <clears throat> the next thing I want to talk about is the same set of ceramics, but in a different context. And that is an, a shipwreck called the Bellatone Wreck. This is a, a, a wreck that, shi a ship that wrecked probably about 830. So again, somewhat coincidentally, right here in our ninth century that we've been at. This is a ship that was filled with cargo, and this is a, a kind of a recreation of what the Belton Wreck ship would have looked like. It's um, it's a called the Dao, right? It's the prevalent style of ship in the Persian Gulf and in the Western Indian Ocean, in which planks of wood are sewn together with rope. They're long and they're thin, and they've got these triangular sails in combination with, with um, square sails. And they would take advantage of the monsoon winds, right, in the, in the Indian Ocean and be able to kind of move around. In the case of the Bellaton Rock, which was wrecked over here, right, is that it was a boat that was made in the Persian Gulf, right, and that it sailed out into the Arabian Sea. It made its way over to the south, southern coast of China, where we know that there were colonies of Muslim merchants, right, living and working and trading um, and then spreading Islam. They were building mosques and things like that. Um, we, we think that the boat was made in the Persian Gulf, but some of the not ingredients, right, what do you make up, the, the elements that it was made out of, Materials. The materials, thank you. Not ingredients, but materials, same thing, right? Okay. Came from Africa, right? We know also that when it wrecked, which was on its return journey, there were elements of the boat that looked like it had been crafted from ropes that were only available from China. So we've got even this one boat, right, which is really, it's knit together again with all of these kinds of elements from various parts of the world. They think what happened was the boat sailed over that direction, overwintered, needed some repairs, filled itself with cargo, and came back around the year 830 and then sank before it could get very far past Indonesia. So it's um, filled with an extraordinary cache of items um, and has become um, a, a real amazing source 
for the kind of material culture that's being traded that we know from documentary sources, but to actually get to see it. And one of the kind of major cargoes of this ship is ceramic bowls, right? Ceramics, there are about 60,000 pieces of ceramic on this, on this ship. So when they traded at that time, which money did they use? Um, I, you know what, I, that's a great question. Let me get to that when I, in the questions. Because there's, I could talk to you a lot about money. I don't want to get off that. <laughs> I could talk about coins for hours. But they, but they certainly have very sophisticated ways of exchange, monetary exchange. There are people who are, are money, money changers, right? They know how to exchange money um, and, and revalue them. That's the short answer. Okay, so we got these 60,000 pieces of ceramic on board. And you can see that they were kind of packed in this really clever way and they were used as ballast on the ship. This is probably... Um, Oh, they also have this, right? They have star anise. So we haven't found a lot of perishable items, but we know that there's some uh, spices, right, on board. One of the things that um, the historians and, and specialists of the ceramics have shown us is that the majority of these bowls are of a particular style and size that was a tea bowl, right, in China. Now, these are being made for the export market, and they're quite positive that this is the case. These are being made in what is referred to as the Changsha Kilns, um, and that, that is inland about 350 miles from the port of Guangzhou, which is Canton, modern Canton, which is where this ship probably went to port. Okay? On board are all of these bowls that look like tea bowls, but they've clearly been made for the export market. That is, they're not made to the same standards as for local consumption. And you can see that some of these uh, bowls that they've, they've inscribed Chinese on them, some of them, they've done this you know, traditional blue and white decoration. Sometimes they've put kind of like mythological creatures on, but sometimes they've made things to look like Arabic, right? <laughs> Because we think that that's the market, right? Essentially, this is, just imagine Baghdad. This is where these things are going, probably. I want to focus on one of the items that was on this, it was in this, this cache of, of ceramic bowls. And it is definitively a tea bowl because it tells us that it's a tea bowl, right? So it says right there, tea bowl. <laughs> and I love this item because somebody in China crafted this for an export market with a tea bowl in mind. And tea is a very popular beverage in Tang, China. They're using it um, in religious contexts, right? Buddhist monks using it to keep awake um, for longer term meditation, but also in social contexts. It really, by the time that this is created in the ninth century, really tea has replaced wine as the premier beverage in, in Tang China. So remember, we have po pockets, colonies of Muslim merchants who are living in coastal China and who are being a part of this trade and exchange, and they pile these things on their boat. Luckily, we think the, the boat sank in shallow enough water that probably all of the merchants got off before the boat sank. So maybe they lived out their lives in Indonesia, right? <laughs> but what did they think this was, right? They don't drink tea back in Baghdad. And I have spent inordinate amounts of time <laughs> in my life thinking about why they did not drink tea in Baghdad, right? There is no evidence outside of the star anise of other organic materials on that, on that ship, on the Belton Wreck. Tea is, of course, hard to find in the underwater context, but there's also really no literary references outside of one kind of throwaway mention um, in Arabic sources that, oh yes, they drink this, this bitter beverage over there. So why if something that looks like a tea bowl and is inscribed as a tea bowl is, is highly desired back in Baghdad, and oops, sorry, and spices and medicinals and 
incenses and aromatics and aromatic wood, big timbers of wood that would smell wonderful and you'd make, and things that you would put in incense, you know, burners and things like that. All of these things are highly desired back in the central Islamic lands and then eventually up into the Mediterranean and the Christian European world. Why not, why not tea? I, I, again, I have huge amounts of thoughts about this. But what I want to, what, what I just want to kind of leave us with for right now is the idea that economic exchange did not, does not necessarily mean cultural transfer, right? Just because they are trading lots of things does not necessarily mean that everything that is happening in those marketplaces, because let's say you could go in and have a cup of tea at the marketplace. And I, I don't know about you, but caffeine makes me feel great. <laughs> Once I have caffeine, I want more caffeine, right? Like there's something that's keeping this, this connection from happening. So although I think we do have elements of a globalized world, I think we also have elements where there's a barrier or there's some kind of boundary um, from keeping everything from, uh, from transferring, right? So it's obvious to me that this is a tea bowl on the Chinese end. What is it when it gets to Baghdad? Who knows? Are they drinking wine out of it? Is it finger bowls at a banquet? Is it just pretty? Does it just look like, oh, look at this it, the fancy thing I got at the market? It, it's hard to really know. But, but, it, but it, what it does is, for me is it calls to mind that when things move from one culture to another, Sometimes they change their meanings. We don't just have a one-to-one -one correlation, right? In some ways, like our, our our silks, right, and the Chinese headless dragon, right? They change their meanings in ways that sometimes the exchange and the cultural transfer works, and sometimes it doesn't. All right, enough tea. Let's move to chocolate. <laughs> So, one of the problems or the limitations about thinking about a globalized world in the pre 15th century period is, of course, that it was not truly global, right? It was not truly planetary. We have a few pieces of evidence. That Vikings made their way over to Canada, of course. There's some newly emerging evidence that there's some exchange up into the Pacific region, maybe um, some blue beads that came from the, the Pacific up to, to Alaska in this period. So there's some connection. But do we really need to have it dot all the way around the globe to be globalizing or to be interconnected in the kind of way that we think of for the 15th century and beyond. So what I like to do, um, particularly with my students, um, and, and I think this is a particularly important framework for when we're thinking about students and when we're thinking about kind of big picture, what is the Middle Ages, is I, I like to use comparative uh, things, right? So here we have some pieces of pottery that are these tall, thin, uh, like jars in a sense, that took place in the Western Hemisphere. Of course, chocolate, cocoa does not make it across the Atlantic until after, you know, the 15th century. It just couldn't have, right? So we know why, <laughs> we know why it didn't, right? It's not like tea, tea, they had the opportunity, cocoa, they didn't. Okay, these objects, right, these, these jars were found here. This is called Pueblo Bonito. It's at Chaco uh, Culture National Historical Park um, in Northern New Mexico, a couple of hours from where I normally live. Um, and it was um, built probably, this is room, they were found in room 28. Um, and as you can see here, this Chaco Canyon, right, has, we're, we're, we're above, obviously, and looking down. And then there's this um, break, right, in the canyon. And then up where we are in this image are a series of roads. Now, we know that the people of the pre-Hispanic Americas did not have the wheel, right? So that we know that these roads are not for wheeled vehicles. 
but archaeologists have surmised that the roads would have made runners with packs much uh, faster. It would have really facilitated that kind of, of quick movement. And indeed, we know that there's a huge amount of north-south exchange and kind of radial exchange going in and out of Chaco in, uh, again, the northwest of, of what is today New Mexico. So there's extensive road networks that are about 400 miles of networks out. Some of it's been erased, right? But we think that there's about 400 miles of, of roads in and out. We also know that Chaco is a kind of a cultural center. It's kind of a, um, a religious center. It may be a, a diplomatic center. It's like it's the city, right? If you're part of this, um, of this culture, um, which we call the ancestral Puebloan people. It's the people who were formerly known as the Anasazi, right? But we call them the ancestral Puebloan. Chaco is the kind of hub, right, for all of this. Um, we also think it may have been an economic hub. One of the rooms of Pueblo Benito found a uh, was found a bunch of scrap of uh, turquoise. And the turquoise we know was imported from about 125 miles away on the other side of Santa Fe. Um, and it, it's a scrap is all that's left, which implies that it's a workshop where turquoise jewelry is being made, right? Probably for the export market. Okay. So the chocolate. Chocolate, whoops, let's, yeah, let's show that one. Chocolate is, of course, indigenous to Mesoamerica, central Mexico, South Guatemala, Belize, El Salvador, and Honduras. It is not indigenous to where Chaco is, right? We know that the cocoa tree um, produces um, of the big pods, right, that became exceedingly important to the economic, the cultural, and religious sy systems of the pre-Hispanic Americas. You can see here, this is a late Maya, late classic Maya uh, ritual beverage. Um, again, probably about the ninth century. This one's at the Art Institute of Chicago. But if you're ever in DC and you go to the Dumbarton Oaks, um, there are a number of these chocolate vessels on display in their little museum there. Um, and it really, um, it, so it was valued as a medicinal, as a, you know, tasty, comestible, uh, spiritual aid, but also really important as uh, administrative and diplomatic, right? So preparing cocoa in the, this pre-Hispanic world was very similar, in fact, to tea. There's a lot of frothing, there's a lot of pouring, and it really takes a kind of specialized knowledge to be able to do this, right? And that's where these come in. Again, these were found in Chaco, and they were discovered to have traces of cocoa in them. So they are physically, they look like, and they contain traces of cacao. So how did it get there? Well, we know that there are long distance exchanges going north and south, right? And we know that, um, that there are certain really prized elements, right? Things like um, macaw feathers, right? Which again, are from that kind of Mexico and South region. Macaw feathers have been found here. That right, turquoise, we don't know. There's other things coming into to Chaco but the idea that something is coming all the way from kind of central Mexico up, and it is something that is a, a highly kind of stylized ritual beverage, has suggested to some archaeologists, um, including some at, at the University of New Mexico, um, says that what we are witnessing here is a kind of transculturation, not just trade, because you wouldn't necessarily just be able to trade this good, but that you would need to learn how to make the, the, the liquid, how to froth it and pour it, what kind of diplomatic spaces and encounters you would use it in, um, and then also, you know, to have the stuff, right? Have the, the, the cacao itself. So one of the things that's been suggested about this is that um, at this time, 
there may have been a few governing families in the Maya who controlled this. And so that may suggest that there was a family or a, an elite power structure at Chaco who had not just an economic relationship with the Maya, but some kind of a diplomatic or a cultural, sorry, exchange um, in which they were learning these things, right? Which again brings me back to the tea, right? And the question about like, what are the diplomatic and religious and social spaces that are not taking place that the, the, the tea doesn't transfer? But again, en enough about tea, right? So to conclude, right? Let's, let's think about interconnectedness and what kinds of things we mean by interconnectedness. And one historian who works on this idea of a globalized pre-modern has said that interconnectedness is not enough, that what we really need is interdependence, that the idea is not simply that things can transfer, but that the transfers themselves are fundamental and productive to the communities in which we're fighting these transfers. That, that the exchanges themselves which are not simply economic, but also cultural and religious and social and diplomatic and a number of these different things, themselves shape the cultures that, are, that are, are part of our exchange. And so what the global Middle Ages asks us to do is to think about the aspects of those exchanges that do work, <laughs> the ones that do not work, where are the barriers to interconnectedness, and also who are the agents of that interconnection, right? Not simply that there are marketplaces in Paris and London where people want to have mace and cinnamon and things from Indonesia and China, but, but to think about the process and the human agents who are doing the transfer and to recenter our world. And I will tell you in my last, you know, one minute here that all of this work I should have started with this, right? All of this work um, is, is sort of not peripheral <laughs> to my main work that I'm doing here, but it's part of um, a kind of side project that I work on is we have, uh, I and a team have worked on uh, this. This is our first edition. We're currently working on the second edition of a global medieval textbook, right? A textbook for use in undergraduate classrooms. And so what I want to emphasize is that I think that the global medieval is not necessarily perfect as a, as a heuristic, right, as a way of understanding, but I think it is absolutely vital for us to recenter and refocus the way we teach about the Middle Ages and how we think about it. And really in some ways to go back to Yuki's original point to bring it back to the center of our attention, right? And not think of it as this kind of fusty, dark, right? We all, we all, medievalists all rail against the idea of it being the dark ages, right? But also to have the evidence for that. And the evidence is that this is an extremely vibrant and very fluid and very interconnected world. Um, and I'll leave it there, but I will happily talk about coins. <laughs> <laughs> So I chose not to have any images of coins uh, because I can get off track about coins. Um, but of course, we, we know that medieval um, merchants in particular are extremely sophisticated in the ways that they use money and use exchange. Um, for example, we know that in medieval marketplaces, there are people whose job is to be a money changer. And they can be very, very sophisticated about the ways that they understand fineness, the metallic content, um, and also weight, obviously. Um, some coins circulate on face value, right? You look at it and you know who the authority is and you say, yes, that's really wonderful. Other coins circulate um, based on weight, right? So you might have a little small purpose of coins that would weigh a certain amount. And so um, the coinness of it is, is almost incidental in one, in one sense, except that coins also communicate a lot about culture and authority and um, 
in some cases, religion and various things like that. So there are other things, of course, that that circulate as monetary, um, you know, units of exchange, including silk. Right along the Silk Roads, we know that the bolts of undyed silk could often be used as a money. Um, so, although the Belgian rack, as far as I know, doesn't have any coins on it, this is a highly monetized world. <laughs> Not in Europe, right? But the rest, the rest of this world is highly monetized. Europe won't be deeply monetized until the end of the medieval period. Yes, sir. Um, is it, isn't most of what's going on, at least in Western Europe, uh, purchases whatever the coin was and, and the remuneration by elites? Or did this really percolate to the level of rural peasantry? That's a, that's a great question. Um, so if we're thinking about Europe in particular, most of what we would call the rural peasantry, right, or, or people who are um, laborers are probably themselves never using coin. Now that's that's Europe, right? There, um, there's pretty strong evidence that all exchanges in, let's say, Islamic Alexandria or Cairo, almost all of them are taking place with coin. Even poor people have access to coin. Europe, however, kind of on the edges, right? Really, not so much. However, by the time we get to around the year 1000 in Europe, uh, monetization is taking off, and people who are of what we would call maybe a middle class or an artisanal class of people, merchants, makers, urban dwellers, are themselves more and more using coin. But one of the interesting things about uh, coinage in Europe is that the only place where you can get gold, somebody stop me when I start talking too much about this, is West Africa. So if you have trade relations with West Africa, you have gold. If you do not, you do not. Right? And so what do they have that's highly desired up here? This is a big question. What what could Europe trade out for the stuff that they wanted in? Um, but we know that in, I would just say roughly all of the rest of this area, um, coinage is, is pretty common for people at, at, at all kinds of levels. It's really not until that later medieval period that, that a European city dweller would be paid in coin and pay for something in coin. Did that sort of answer? Again, I could talk forever about it. Yeah, I have a non-coin question. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Not any question. Is it just fortuitous that you mentioned um, the glazed pieces during the Tang Dynasty and then was ninth century, and then during the Mayans was also ninth century? Just fortuitous. It was just fortuitous. But isn't that cool? No, no, no. But would you say, would that be indicative that societies pass through similar stages? You know, it's a, it's a good question because I think there are many ways in which nobody who works on the Western Hemisphere would argue that the levels of kind of technological development and things like that yeah. are the same as what's happening in Europe. Um, but I will say that the Tang period is kind of a high point for this exchange. And that same ninth century is kind of a high point for that kind of exchange in the Western Hemisphere. That systems do collapse actually after that and then and then rebuild. Um, sometimes I think that there are climatological reasons that we can see similarities. So like, for example, when I went to Chaco, the um, the National Park Tour Guide was telling us about collapse that's happening in like 1430 to 1450. And, and, and I'm like, I mean, 13, 1340 to 1350. And I'm like, well, there's a huge amount of collapse that's happening in Europe at that same time. Isn't that interesting? And then we start to talk about climatological reasons, perhaps that something is happening, um, you know, Black Death and, and yeah, social yeah. collapse. I'm like, Are you I saying the Tang was it was a high point? So when did glazing start in Europe, as opposed to a Mayan civilization? Uh, so pottery glazing in in Europe? Yeah. Um, it's never this kind of high level. Um, the porcelain technology will move over to the Islamic world and become quite fine, but not until much I think much later in Europe. Um, they're interested in other things more than than porcelain. They're interested in silk and spices and gold if they can get it. Yes. So uh, it's really interesting, your T-Bowl referenced uh, 
So well, how many years ago would that have been like 1500 when you found it when they found uh, when that uh, the, when it sank, it was 830. Oh, 1100. All right. Mm -hmm. So really interesting because I mean, you live abroad and you live in different cultures. I lived in Japan for a long time and you, it always was really not funny, but seemed curious to me that people would use English and not really know what it meant or then appropriate in terms of what they liked about it, sound or whatever. And then even even hear the use of, of, of you know, Japanese and Chinese symbols. Right. And so it's good, interesting to see that perhaps in, in Baghdad. They didn't even know what it meant. It looked cool. It was really fun. Right. You know, I'm really different. I can it just I, and you can see that when you're a culture and you come into that culture, you're like, wait, why did they use that? Right. So I was just curious your take on like that appropriation as opposed to tea. Right. And I think that that is a lot of it, right? It's a status symbol. Um, and and you know, we do this all the time with with kind of like Chinese characters, right? In the mix, maybe you have a t-shirt that says something like Chinese characters or tattoos, right? That you really don't actually have any connection to the language or or the culture, and you maybe don't even know what it says, and maybe there's some errors, right? And I think that we can see things like that going on here. Even well, at 50 hour, love now you're the same yeah. mindset. Still the same very similar mindset and very much a, a status symbol mindset and very much a look guys you got knockoffs <laughs> you bought the you bought the cheap knockoff version of the tea bowls you should see what real tea bowls look like right this really fine almost translucent um when i when i teach this i i i tend to try to use examples like this to humanize medieval people um, apparently, I say this so often it becomes a joke among my students that medieval people were people. Um, right? They're not so foreign. Um, they certainly process cultural things in very different ways than we do, but there are very similar elements. And we say they wanted fancy stuff, right? We want fancy stuff. What does that fancy stuff mean to them? It might be something different than it does to us. But I think that there are ways in which we can see them as just you know, people. So, so so I asked well, it's related to the other questions and like what Ray asked for who used this? Is it mainly the nobility, the 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 priests and so on? Or are, I mean, um so who used it where? I mean uh, the items uh, like silk, uh, these kind of objects. These kinds of objects. It, this would be hard to know. Um, I don't actually know with these bowls, like so let's say in Baghdad, are they priced accessibly um, for regular people, or are they, um, you know, used at elite courts? I, I don't act. I don't actually know. Right, who the intended kind of class market was. What would you posit? What would you? I, I would posit that in the Islamic world, probably there's a middling class of people who have access to these kinds of things. Um, because one of the things that we certainly know um, about Europe, for example, these city dwellers who will eventually have access to coin, boy, you know what they want? They want what the elite has. And they want to spice their food the way the elites spice their food. And they want to wear clothes that look like what the elite wore. Um, and often they will be of lower quality or, or um, let's say spiced food. It will be of less, like the middle class recipes in you know, London will be less heavily spiced, but they still have the desire to do those things. Uh, I see these these bowls as being right a similar market because if you're the caliph you have probably a lot more means to have a much nicer amount of how was europe paying for the spices i mean spices used to be more expensive than gold right I mean, pepper was per weight was a lot more expensive than than gold and europe look 10th, 11th century, they don't have much to trade. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so, yeah. so some of the things that we see being traded out of Europe into, let's say, the Mediterranean that would then move on um, are things that Europe does have, which is timber, uh, furs. Um, eventually, the, amber? Um, we don't see a lot of desire for amber, actually, um, in the Islamic hate world. We see a huge desire for textiles. Yeah. So let's say we're talking about trade between Christian Europe and just the Islamic world on the other side of the Mediterranean. Forget the Indian Ocean for, uh, for a moment. What do they want in Islamic Egypt that Europe might have? They actually want, they want textiles. They want wool. 
uh, well, they want the same reasons, right? But they want wool, they want textiles, um, they want furs. Um, and then, of course, the other is is humans, right? And so one of the big suppositions about what Europe has for export is is enslaved humans. And that 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 some historians have said that actually balances the exchange, right? Humans for so coffee is in is in Africa, but it doesn't seem to have been pulled out for um, use in right, right. It doesn't, as far as I know, there's no. But again, right? Once you have it, you're like, yeah, sign me up. I like more of that. <laughs> how do I how do I get more of that thing? Yes. I mean, okay, that's you and then you and you. Are you trying to get my? Okay. Yeah. What date has been attributed to the Samite uh, tapestry? Um, the, the first one I started with, eighth yeah. and ninth century. Nine. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. What is it? I just have a question about the cocoa uh -huh. um, cups. What do you think those little like hinges that the decorative little? It I'm almost looks like a rope with those. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you know what those were for? I, I don't, but I would posit that they're for holding on to it while you're frothing and pouring because you don't want that thing to slip out of your hand. And it's a pretty elaborate series of backs and forths and, and froths and things. Yes. Uh, you've shown us a lot of evidence of ceramics and boats that carry trade and so forth. It seems to me there must have been a fairly large population of like salesmen. Mm -hmm. Along with this, mm -hmm. is there evidence of who they were and how they were educated? Yes, that's an excellent question. So, one of the things that, as a Mediterranean historian, I have a really wonderful access to a cache of documents called the Geniza, and the Geniza are written in uh, Judeo Arabic, right? So, they're written in Arabic in Hebrew characters. And they were stored in a synagogue in in Cairo. And so they were preserved for this huge amount of time. And a lot of the documents in that cache are written, they're merchant letters, many of them, written by the Jews who were the trade people in the Mediterranean and actually out into the I Indian Ocean. For example, one of the things I, I talk about in the in the textbook is a letter, a remarkable letter we have from Maimonides, right? The great philosopher and theologian. Um, and his brother was one of these merchants who went to the Indian Ocean and he didn't want his brother to go and he did and his ship sank and he died. And this letter is expressing Maimonides' years long depression after his brother died. And I think this is, is a really illustrative example of humanizing people from the past, but also who the agents of that trade were. And they were in networks with each other, right? So these are groups where we can see from these letters that they rely on each other. They rely on um, market knowledge. So it's, it, it's remarkably modern in some ways. So we'll read letters that will say, Pepper is selling really well at the port of Palermo. Please get over here with that load of pepper before the prices drop. Or they'll say things like, you know, I got here with a load of red turbans um, because they were really fashionable last year, but this year nobody wants a red turban. This year they want blue turbans. So I've got all this junk that I can't offload. And so one of the ways in which we see those merchants working is very much in concert and based on information. Those are highly literate people. Obviously, they're like writing letters. Not everybody would be literate, um, especially, you know, not in, in Europe, um, but they would probably still be relying on those kinds of networks of knowledge. Um, and we see a lot of kind of different arrangements for the way that trade worked, right? An investor who's the knowledgeable person and then the younger people in the family or in the network or who are doing the, you know, taking the risk of movement across space. Um, and then they're relying, you know, we've talked about coins, right? They're probably relying on the expertise of other people. They themselves 
um, probably have at least a passing familiarity with how to test a coin, right? But then you would rely on the expertise of somebody. Um, and then as banking and credit become more sophisticated, then there become people who that's their specific job is to, you know, mediate credit exchange and things like that, bookkeeping, essentially. That's a short answer. Yes. Your so, so I'm going to use the pro my privilege of having introduced you to ask the last question, right. which I didn't have a chance to ask you at dinner the other week, which how did you become a medievalist? <laughs> that is a really good question. <laughs> um, sometimes I say that um, when I was a kid, I watched the uh, the Marco Polo, did, did anybody, which was Richard, Richard Chamberlain. Oh, <laughs> so exciting. It was set in this really cool world of the medieval period. Um, the, the, the real answer is I thought about being a classicist. I learned Greek and Latin. Um, one of my professors told me not to do that. Sorry to all the classicists in the room. My professor told me not to do that because there were no jobs in classics. <laughs> I didn't want to be, be a medievalist instead. Um, and then when I got into graduate school, then I learned Arabic. And so I've be, been able to kind of knit together these various things. Um, and, and, and I will say, uh, here's what I can speak with confidence to is what I find exciting about this. Um, part of it is the ability to find the humanity um, and the shared kind of resonances with these people in the deep past, but to really explore that in a time and space that's distant enough from us that it that it feels strange and familiar at the same time, right? Um, yeah, I, <laughs> and there's cool stuff to look at. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, Sarah, thank you so, so much.